x and y. Now these are not vectors. So we'll start by talking about this function. And I've changed my notation a little bit. Since we now have only one vector, I'm, just call, I'm calling its entries x, y, z if we go to three dimensions. So we're dealing with only one vector a. And when you're down to one vector a, so in other words, you're considering lowercase a transpose a, capital A, lowercase a, then it's no longer called a linear, a bilinear form. It is now called a quadratic form because there's only one input. So this is a quadratic form. You can think of it as a quadratic function. It's a perfect multi-dimensional generalization of quadratic functions. Quadratic functions are simple, ax squared, that's all you can have in one dimension. I'm not talking about linear shifts or constants, just the quadratic part. And that's the most general you can get in n dimensions, in this case two dimensions. So we're looking at a quadratic form and we're questioning its positive definiteness. In other words, not in other words, it's a definition. We're questioning the positive definiteness of this matrix. It's the, this matrix is positive definite if the associated quadratic form is positive definite. It's just a synonym. And the question of positive definiteness can only be asked of a, met, of a matrix that's symmetric. And this matrix is? And so we're asking, is it positive definite? In other words, is this expression always positive for any x and y as long as they're not both zero? So to connect this notation to the notation we had before, I'll just write that our vector a is this. That's what our vector a is. I'm now focusing on its entries a little bit more and skipping the subscripts. In three dimensions, it'll be x, y, z. So that was that vector. They cannot be simultaneously zero because that's what it mean for that's what it would mean for the vector to be zero. Zero one. Zero one would be a good example. So here, I started with a matrix that has one dead giveaway, a negative number on the diagonal, which would correspond to a negative quadratic term. And the reason why it's an instant giveaway for lack of positive definiteness is that you can easily, quote unquote, extract that entry. If I set all of these components of the vector to zero, except the one that, that's in the same position as the negative number on the diagonal, it will very simply extract that number. And so the, the example that, was, that came from the audience is zero, one. Of course, zero, one. Because if you try zero, one, or if this was in more dimensions, all entries are zero except for the one where the negative number is. That, that right there is a counter example that will produce minus eight. And so this is clearly not positive definiteness, which means that this matrix cannot be used for the classical inner product satisfying these three properties. So this was easy. How about this? Is this positive definite? Yes. This can only be decided by a vote. If you say that it's not positive definite, you have to give me a counterexample. You have to say, here is a vector for which it's, the result will not be positive. That's how this game is played. Zero, negative one. Let's try zero, negative one. Remember, I know what you're going after. You want to make this eight negative. But if y is negative one, the way eight shows up in the expression, if you were to get it back to this form, would be eight y squared, right? So your minus one will get paired up with another minus one, and it will be positive very strongly positive. It's nice to have large positive numbers on the diagonal. So zero minus one does not break it. Another guess. 
No, strictly real discussion. If, if, if you allow imaginary numbers, then you can have 10, 0, 0, 10, and you put an I, and there you go. So as I mentioned before, when you allow imaginary numbers, these will change. More specifically, surprisingly, this one will change. Commutativity changes. Uh, complex numbers are very funny in the way they affect change. And these two will be perfectly intact. Yes. This one will change. Minus 3, 1. Let's try minus 3, 1. And then we'll talk about how they may have come up with it. Minus 3, 1. So from here, we'll have minus 3. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> from here, we'll have 9. From here, we'll have 8. So we're at 17. And these will give us minus 9 and minus 9. My goodness, 17 minus 18. <laughs> sorry. Isn't that beautiful? 3 and 1. How did they come up with that? Excuse me, negative 3 and 1. So let's come up with this ourselves. And once we do it once, and then we do it again for the matrix A, B, B, C, we'll just see something super cool. And that will give us our first hint of a criterion at positive definiteness. Something that's very natural and that you're very much familiar with will come out. But here's how I would think about it. So let me copy down the matrix. Here's what I'll do. I'll say maybe there is a vector like this. So I'm going to try and solve for it. I will try alpha beta, which would have been perfectly fine. Alpha beta here, alpha beta here, multiply it out, see what this expression tells me. That's a perfectly fine way of doing it. I'll simplify it by one step. Instead of alpha beta, I realize that I can scale this vector whatever way I want. So I would first try alpha 1, right? That's sort of like alpha beta scaled by beta, 1 over beta. So I will just try alpha 1 just to have less complexity. So we have no, nothing to do but to multiply this out. So let's see what we will get. And now I look at this expression and I remark to myself, well, I want to find alpha for which it's negative. But I'm looking at a quadratic equation with a positive coefficient for the square. So I know it's a parabola that looks like this. And does it ever get negative? Well, it would get negative if, it, if this as a quadratic equation had a zero, right? Because it has, if it, it, we know almost everywhere it's positive. So if it's negative somewhere, it needs to have a couple roots. So if this equation has a couple roots, then somewhere, for some value of alpha, it'll be negative. Well, let's see if it has a couple roots. Let's find its discriminant. I think I have enough space here. The discriminant equals 36 minus 32. Am I right? 4. I do have roots. In fact, my roots are, well, now I'm just going to guess them. They, the multiplication, they, the product is 4. Excuse me. The product is 8, and the sum is minus 6. Minus 2 and minus 4. So my two roots are minus 2 and minus 4. So this expression right here is a parabola that looks like this. Minus 2, minus 4. That's a pretty good drawing, right? So for most all alphas, it's positive. But between minus 2 and minus 4, it's negative. That's why these guys chose minus 3, smack in the middle. That's the smallest this value can be. Minus 3. So when you take alpha equals minus 3, you're right here. But they could have taken any number between minus 2 and minus 4. And this would be a negative value. So the most important takeaway from this is that the question of positive definiteness is subtle. You look here and you say to yourself, 
boy, they're all positive numbers. That's good. The values on the diagonal are pretty large, right? We want large numbers on the diagonal to have positive definiteness because that's, that's the quadratic terms. That's x squared and y squared. The stronger they are, the more likely it is to be positive definiteness. And here we have eight, great. The off diagonals are positive as well. Actually, that means nothing. The sign of these guys means nothing. If I went from three to minus three, it would change this. And it would simply flip everything to the other side. It just flips things to the other side. So the sign of the off diagonal entries doesn't matter. What matters is their relative size for uh, relative to the diagonal terms. And in this case, they're just a little bit too big. So if this was larger, for example, nine, that's an interesting case. What if this was nine? Then this would be nine, and then there would be a single root right at minus three. It's a double root, but only one value. And that would mean that it, for alpha equals minus three, this value is zero. Does that break positive definiteness? Yes, it does. It needs to be strictly positive. We've talked about this. So this would still be not a positive definite quadratic form. It would be positive semi-definite. It would be on the brink. But if this was 10, then there are no roots. It would be a negative discriminant, no roots, and therefore the parabola is high up. You can kind of see that. All you have to do is lift it by one and then by a little bit more. And then the form is positive definite. So for eight, no. For nine, still no. For 10, yes, positive definiteness. So it's this very fine balance between the diagonal and the off diagonal entries. And let's try to discover exactly what that balance is. And it's beautiful. The way it works out is beautiful. So what I'm going to do is, instead of having specific numbers, let's have A, B, B, C and see what happens. So why don't you guys copy this problem over with A, B, B, C, continue with the analysis, find the discriminant, and then have a eureka moment where you say, I know what that expression is. Enjoy. Do you guys know how to do the discriminant when the, middle co when the linear coefficient is even? There's a simplified formula. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just do discriminant over four so I don't have to divide it to do it later. Discriminant over four equals So, so you repeat your analysis for this more general matrix you arrive once again at a quadratic expression with respect to alpha. And then you once again say, well, we know for a fact that we want A to be positive. <coughs> so we have a parabola that's facing up. And we want it to have no zeros. We want it to be safely above the x-axis. So the discriminant, and in this case I wrote down discriminant divided by 4, because otherwise you'd have a factor of 4 on the right-hand side, is B squared minus, minus AC. So this, so this would be a positive, a positive quadratic form if two, if two conditions are satisfied. If A is greater than zero and AC, excuse me, and B squared minus AC is less than zero. We want the discriminant to be negative. We want there to be no roots. So in other words, AC is greater than b squared. That's what we want. We want this, I believe this still fits in the form, to be less than zero. Let me say it in another way, and then you'll say, hey, I recognize something. So we want a to be positive, and ac minus b squared to be positive. And what is ac minus b squared? Everybody knows what it is. The determinant. So we need the top right number to be positive, and we want the determinant of this matrix to be positive. Or I can actually put it in another way. 
it'll sound, it, it'll sound funny, funny, but I need this, I need this one by one sub matrix to be to have a positive determinant. So I need this, so I need this determinant to be positive and this determinant to be positive. So the remarkable fact that I'm about to tell you that generalizes is that an n-dimensional quadratic form is positive definite if only if it's both a necessary and a sufficient condition. If you identify the following n determinants, just the top left entry by itself, the top left two by two matrix, the top left three by three matrix, the top left four by four matrix, I guess this is a five by five matrix, and the five by five matrix. If all of these determinants are positive, then the quadratic form is positive definite. And vice versa. If the quadratic form is positive definite, then all of these determinants are positive. It's a necessary and sufficient condition for positive definiteness. So that's one criterion. That's our first criterion. We've just stated it. We haven't proven it. We actually will prove it because it's a lot of lovely linear algebra. 